Hi everyone, welcome to Learn Chat, where you always, usually always, learn something new. I am joined today by my good friend and co-host, Leslie Price. She is with www.learnappeal.com. And uh, if you don't know about Learn Appeal, you should. It's a great charity. In fact, we also have a guest today, Lucy Hodge, who's one of the volunteers for Learn Appeal. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, Lucy, <laughs> Lucy, Leslie, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good in a very wet and rainy England, I'm afraid. Very oh. wet and rainy. Yeah, we're kind of but, getting but, wet. Hmm. Yeah, but it's, uh, but it's lovely to be here. Lovely to be here. Sounds good. Well, here we go then. And nice to be able to chat. And nice to be able to chat to Lucy. Yes. Well, we are back, and joining us today is Lucy Hodge. Uh, Lucy, would you like to do the? Benefit of the introduction, you you folks know each other well. Yes, yeah, um, well, <laughs> yes. Um, well, I've known Lucy for quite a few years now. Um, she works for Walkgrove, which um, Sarah Smith of Walkgrove is actually one of the trustees of Learn Appeal. Hmm. But Lucy has her own personal interest in Learn Appeal, not just in volunteering, but she, Lucy at the moment is uh, working towards her PhD and is going to be doing quite a piece actually on Learn Appeal. So at some point, you know, during the chat, we might have time to talk about that because, I mean, we're absolutely delighted at Learn Appeal that we're going to have an academic thesis, an academic paper published about the work that we're doing. Nice. And poor Lucy, after... <laughs> um, after Eric was here at uh, Learning Technologies, Lucy went off with a bundle full of paper, all the forms that, that nowadays in, in, in the developed world, we're so used to filling in online, but in Kenya, it's all still done on paper. Hmm. But I think Lucy, want, we want to talk about other things today as well. And I think one of the things that Lucy's mentioned is um, cognitive. Uh, the impact of yes. cognitive knowledge, the impact of just the impact of cognitive things on learning. Yes, absolutely. So um, thank you ever so much for that introduction, Leslie. And it's really, really lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Rick, for inviting me. Um, and it was lovely to meet you at uh, Learn Appeal um, down at Excella a couple of months ago. Um, so yes, one of the things that I actually had, had a bit of a chat uh, there about was about sort of the cognitive aspects of learning and the cognitive aspects of learning theory. And I think that as instructional designers, that's somewhere we can often be a little bit light on the theory. And often what that can mean is that we end up designing things that perhaps we don't completely understand. Um, and we'll, perhaps we do things because we've been taught that that's what we should be doing through best practice, through industry. However, we don't necessarily understand why that is. And that makes it sometimes very difficult to actually challenge um, the reasons why we're doing things. Uh, one of the big things which is central to Learn Appeal, for example, is the use of um, responsive design, uh, which centers on scrolling uh, so that uh, learning can be um, learning can be accessed on mobile phone. And I know that in the early days um, in uh, which mobile design uh, was coming in, you know, sort of the early um, 2010, round about that time, there was a lot, uh, you know, a great deal of resistance actually within the industry um, in general and particularly from clients um, and uh, some designers who were saying, but do you know what? One of the key principles is you shouldn't scroll. There should be no scrolling in e-learning. Um, and on one hand, that's kind of true, but on the other hand, it's true for a very different reason. Um, and it, it's all, all about understanding things that are very diagrammatic. Um, and so actually, when I dug into it, this is one of the reasons why I actually started my PhD was because um, I was being told perhaps by colleagues or reading things online and saying, this is what you need to do. And there was no why you need to do this. There was no actual explanation. 
and trying to cut out time in your working week is incredibly difficult uh, to find time for actually when you're trying to produce solutions and when you're trying to write great training um, packages it's very difficult to actually have that time in your day to go and do that background research and so to force myself to do that um, that was one of the the main reasons why I actually started doing my PhD was that I was incredibly interested in the theory to make me a better learning designer because I obviously want to do the best job that I can and make sure that I do things that are really evidence-based, that are really based in cognitive theory and our understanding of how our minds work and how we learn. Um, and I found that in industry, because we're so busy trying to get to the end point so much of the time, and particularly if you're relatively early in your career, as, as I was back then, you know, looking about 10 years ago, that was sort of the start of my career. Um, you don't necessarily have that time. You're, you're, you're not told by your boss, yeah, you can take some time off, Lucy, to read about this stuff. <laughs> you're actually told, you know, you just have to get there and produce it. And I wanted to make sure that I was really doing something that was worthwhile and people would actually learn from because the whole point of the reason why we're doing this is to make sure that people really learn and learn in the best possible way. Well, Lucy, and you, you, you made a right. What do you mean by, sorry, what do you mean? So some, some of the people um, who, are, who are viewing this, watching this, might not know what cognitive theory even is. Yes. <laughs> right. So um, basically, it's about understanding how our minds work and how we learn, how we process information generally. Because, of course, when we're learning, there's a very key bit of kit that we need to use, which is our brains. And um, over time, we learn more and more about things through uh, different areas of research. And of course, the models that we have of the mind now are very different to the ones we had even 50 years ago. Um, and uh, that was around the time when we started to get, you know, a move on from behaviorism, black box input output um, ideas and actually look at things in a, in a richer understanding. You know, the brain is that black box in a way. But really, we want to dig inside that and find out what is happening when we get these inputs? How do we actually process them? Um, and what can we do? That There are a lot of really, really interesting things um, that people perhaps don't understand. Um, so for example, um, perhaps thinking about audio um, and listening to things, you know, often you might have something that's perhaps quite nice music in the background and that that's fine. What becomes difficult is actually when you have text on screen and text being read out at the same time. And that's something that lots and lots of clients want for a whole variety of reasons, but it's actually not great for the learner. Um, and so this is something I'll fight a lot in meetings. Um, and that's because both the things that you hear, words, and what you read, words, they both are a sort of verbal channel um, and it uses up the same space in your mind and so actually it really slows down your processing and there's been research done on this that actually it's best to have one or the other um, and if you have got audio make sure that you don't play it at the same time as something you've got up on screen or make sure that it's different so you perhaps if you've got bullet points on screen you'll have full audio or the other way around you'll have full text on the screen but then you'll read out sort of bullet points or a key summary making sure that you don't have the same input at the same time because that actually lessens the likelihood that you will learn well Lucy um, it's it, really <laughs> it's really interesting you're saying that. You know, we took that approach with some clients. Not all clients like it, but no. what we would do is we would have the audio talking. But at the bottom in the navigation area, these were not scrolling pieces, but in the bottom you would have read it. And they could press on the read it button, and now the screen would be covered up by the text that was just read. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that worked for some people um, that because that's mm -hmm. how we got around the you have to have they had so much text on some of these things that and they were t they were training salespeople which is even worse. They don't want to read yeah. that much. So, <laughs> no, so, absolutely. So you've got this issue of now they're getting mm -hmm. the the verbal or audio input. And now they're reading mm -hmm. uh, 500 words and it's just like, uh, and Absolutely. so by doing the read it, the ones who wanted to read could read it. The ones who wanted to listen mm -hmm. could listen. And it worked out yeah. well. And if they wanted to do both at the same time, they could, but they weren't forced to. 
-hmm. the results we got were pretty good on that. The people liked the course more. The ones who were auditory loved it. The ones who wanted to read loved it too because they didn't have to worry about the audio part of it. They could skip that. But it's, you know, not everybody wants that. And a lot of clients, for example, want everything. They do want it on the screen. They want it. And that's okay. And then there's another bunch of theories out there that are even worse. They give you the verbal different from what you're hearing. I mean, the, the written text. So now you're confusing people because not everybody can read and hear at the same time. Mm -hmm. Nobody can read and hear at the same time. Yeah. That, that's part of the key. That's part of the key point there. It's really important that you either have the audio first and then the text if you're going uh, that way, or vice versa, really, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you don't have those two conflicting things going on at the same time. I mean, imagine if you're trying to read a book and you're also trying to listen to a different audio book at the same time. You can't do that. It's, Unless you're it's a teenager. basically not possible. Yeah. Well, well, no, even, even <laughs> then. <laughs> Ask, uh, ask for a summary of both afterwards. You might get 50%. Yeah. That's because you've got 50% of the time they can read it, 50% right. of the time they're listening to it. They can't actually do both at once, no matter what they tell now, you. Now, this Sitting is interesting. in front of the television doing this, homework. This is the argument I've had with my daughter and many other people. Turn the TV off when you're doing your homework. No, it helps me study. No, it doesn't. It doesn't, it's just it doesn't help them study at, at all. all. Absolutely. At all. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very true. It doesn't help you study. Uh, there are some things where perhaps, again, if, if it's more sort of ambient noises, ambient yeah. sounds, that's fine. Um, so if there isn't a verbal component to it, um, then that's a different thing. But again, if, if you're looking at the TV screen and you're still trying to read something, you, you can't because you, you can't actually look right. at both at the same time. So really, I'm well, sorry. I, I, mean, I know I tried to con my parents into this when I was, <laughs> when I was a teenager. Sorry, sorry, mom. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, you know, calm. Lucy, Lucy this, is, this brings up another point. Everybody says they're multitaskers. No. It doesn't really exist in the human brain. They know how no, to switch quickly. They're switching Absolutely. quickly. There's a very mm -hmm. big difference yeah. between I can do four things at once and I can switch four things at once. Yes, and, and when you tell people, no, you're not really doing them at the same time. Your brain is switching. We're not, we're not Absolutely. really that, you know, our firmware needs to be updated because we don't really do four parallel processes. No. No, um, we absolutely can't. And I think that the areas in which you perhaps can, they're where something's actually an automated task. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for example, if you've learned something really well, you know exactly how to do a right. particular routine, mm -hmm. you yeah. have that muscle memory, yes. then absolutely you can do that and your mind can focus on something else, um, which can happen. Say, for example, when you're driving, you know how to drive a car, it becomes second nature, right. you'll do all sorts of things automatically. And perhaps you can have a conversation or listen to some music while you're doing that because you are that good at the process already. However, when other things start to come in, so for example, something's happening on the other side of the road, there's been an accident there, what happens on our side of the road? The traffic all slows down so everybody can watch it because they can't both drive and look at the same Isn't time. That interesting? It's yeah, actually yeah. not possible. Yep. So <laughs> yeah, we call that over here gawking. They just gawk. They just go and they just keep moving very, very slowly. And I'm the one going, go, go. Don't worry about Absolutely. that. It's not going to change your life. Keep going. They don't go. Yeah, we, we call it rubbernecking. <laughs> rubbernecking. Yeah, is, is, yeah. is it the same in Scotland? Because I, I yeah, know you've got yeah. some some slang in Scotland is is different to some yeah. of the the say mainland sometimes UK South yeah. UK yeah some sometimes rubbernecking sometimes not gawking gawping ah. you know ah, you're gawping yeah. at you're gawping yeah. at something but <laughs> but what you're yeah. saying is interesting because what used to drive me absolutely nuts and still does with a lot of e-learning and i was actually um when I, when I was down in brighton at various um e-learning companies yesterday this actually came up is when you get the text on the screen somebody is reading it out on audio and you can't can't click the next button until the oh. audio is finished and you've actually finished reading it yes. within, you know, it's only like two, three bullet points. You've gone, Brrr, you've read yeah. it, and this person is still, and today, do, 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 you know, 
and and you're trying desperately to press next and nothing will and happen you can't. until well, the audio is finished. Well, you know, oh, Leslie, that, absolutely. that has to do really with a management problem more often than not, mm -hmm. where they say you cannot leave this page until you go through all the content, period. That's not good learning, and these are adults. It doesn't yeah, matter. Absolutely. They're not adults. They're slaves. I mean, you know, you just get this whole, <laughs> uh, and and we've argued that point a million times. Mm -hmm. We usually lose it, but it's just it's not good. And 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 no. then when they get ratings on the e-learning, it's awful. We hate it. It's boring. It's stupid. Blah blah blah. And but they don't get it. They go, no, we must torture you because that's the only way you're going to learn. And absolutely, it doesn't work that way. Um, no. It's, so it, it's very interesting. In, how does this fit into your PhD then, um, Lucy? Um, so, so essentially, th this is more sort of on, on the background work because I wasn't originally going to write my PhD on Learn Appeal. I was originally planning to write it on Cognitive Load. Um, okay. And it was through getting involved in Learn Appeal um, that I decided, you know what? Other people can go out, other people who aren't doing anything as exciting as learn appeal <laughs> they can go out and they can actually uh write their phds on on the cognitive stuff um, so i've done a lot of background reading on it I've, I've written papers um on it as as part of um my phd and done various bits of research um i'm studying at um lancaster university um and it's their course on e-research and technology enhanced learning, which is a part-time distance PhD, um, which means I can do it while I'm working. Otherwise, <laughs> I'd have finished it by now. Um, so it means it's unfortunately a much longer, more drawn out process, but I can, I can work at the same time, which is uh, very important to me because the reason why I'm doing it is to improve my skills in the workforce um, yeah. and to, to write better training um, and, and to help best practice there. But certainly in the future, um, I think that one, once I finish my PhD, it's something I'll definitely want to come back to, um, and particularly from a, an instructional design and um, industry perspective. Um, because what we find um, a lot of the people on, on our cohort on the course, I mean, it is a fully global online course with a huge amount of interactivity and collaboration. Um, so during the first couple of years um, of it, you, you work in a very structured way where you have to produce sort of five different papers, um, but you have to do lots of reading, peer review, peer research. We peer review each other's papers and we have to read pricey things, create presentations, you know, with people, Canada, um, Australia, uh, Kenya, South Africa, Japan, literally global, <laughs> um, oh. all working together, coming up with times that we will chat together and discuss these things. So it's a really, it's a really, really great demonstration of technology enhanced learning um, in which we work together as a cohort um, to help support each other up up through until you go on to your final project, which is the actual thesis, which I've chosen to do on Learn Appeal. Now, uh, Lucy, so, you, so that's kind of how it fits in. Now, no, Lucy, you mentioned really something. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Lucy, you mentioned something early in, in the talk today that, that really got my attention because I'm seeing more of mm -hmm. this. You mentioned scrolling and you mentioned mm -hmm. the yeah. use of scrolling and it sounded like it was in a positive way. Now, the reason I ask mm -hmm. that you've got Evolve from Lab, uh, from Appetier, yep. you've got uh, Ilaris from Curator Solutions, Rise from mm -hmm. Articulate, they're all yep. using that same approach. And, yes. and at first I was going, okay, I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. I, I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. at it going, it's just like surfing a web page in many cases. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking clients. A lot of clients don't like it because it's harder to force people into learning the way they want them to learn. You can't move forward. Yeah. You can't do anything until you look at all the content. Well, when you're scrolling, mm -hmm. it's really hard to know when you've looked at all the content because <laughs> you're really looking on your own and doing things. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. found that interesting. What makes scrolling or the approach of scrolling better? And I wonder, let's not even say uh, better, different. What makes it maybe yes. more effective, different? What's the cognitive uh, reasoning why that's better, the, the ability to have responsive? Well, um, it's interesting because it isn't better per se. I think I'd go with you. It's different. It's a different approach. Um, 
And while there was a lot of initial resistance, uh, one of the reasons for that is actually going back to the items that you have in cognitive load theory, um, which is that you should avoid the split attention effect. Mm. Um, and this came about in the days of CBT, where everybody had really, really tiny screens. Right. And at the time, what people were trying to do often was they would have perhaps an illustrated diagram up the top of the page, but then there was no text that you could read when you saw the di diagram and you would actually have to scroll up and down mm -hmm. to actually read the text. And that's what gave you your split attention effect. Um, and it was specifically because of these really, really small screen designs and particularly when it came to uh, graphical elements or elements that required later description rather than just having something as, as you know a nice background image things that actually required people to look at and learn and understand so perhaps mathematical equations you know you could imagine a, a circuit board if you were doing some mm -hmm. sort of electronic training then what you certainly don't want to have to do is the poor learner to have to scroll up and down constantly going up and down up and down and that created the split attention effect and yeah. so the idea was that that should absolutely be avoided and that's still true. Um, and so when you do create something that's a scrolling course, you do need to make sure still that you avoid that. Um, however, scrolling in itself is neither bad nor good. Um, okay. it, is, it is quite neutral, but what it does allow um, is we no longer live in a world in which everybody has very small fixed screens of a fixed size and fixed dimension where you use flash to design everything it's very very controlled and very very locked down you know everybody will be viewing it on the same on the same type of device uh, using the same browser probably internet explorer 6 or, or mm. something like that <laughs> <laughs> i have i have many many bad memories of this <laughs> Yep. And then you'll find somewhere where Flash doesn't work, and, you know, a whole, a whole other kettle of fish there. And of course, as, as we often move into something where people bring their own devices, so bring their mobile phones, yeah. bring their tablets, or they have different screen sizes. I mean, I have a massive two screen setup with yep. two really wide screens. Um, and if I was to try and take a course that was designed for, you know, 1024 by 768, mm -hmm. which is, you know, better than the 800 by 600, which yes. is what I was potentially designing for, you know, back, back in the day. Um, actually, there's a, there's a lot more screen real estate to play with. I can see a lot more on screen at once. And so the great thing about having a responsive design, what that means is I can see that all on my screen. I don't have, it doesn't have to be stretched massively. It doesn't get distorted. But it also means that people who have smaller screens, um, it will respond appropriately to that it will show the amount of content that fits on their screen and as long as it's designed properly you can avoid all the things like the split attention effect um, and i know that most authoring tools actually are very good in the way that they have been designed um in in the way um that different components and um different elements are often separated um so what that means is if you have a graphic you will either have a graphic and some text next to it or you will have a graphic and maybe a popover and then you will move down to the next chunk mm -hmm. which will then be designed similarly um, and uh, some some authoring tools um, or, or frameworks will allow you to actually change the type of activity that's shown depending on the screen size. Uh, so for example, here I am sitting on a, on a big, big screen PC. It's really lovely to have an image map where I can go around and select lots of different areas. I've got something that's really graphically intensive and, and that, that looks fantastic and that works really well for me. However, if I'm trying to do that on a mobile phone, I've got this little tiny screen that massive graphic with lots and lots of hotspots, that doesn't work so well for me anymore. Right. Um, and so actually thinking about replacing that with a different type of component, with a different type of learning activity that fits the device. Um, that's something that uh, some authoring tools um, actually do, which I, I think is a really, a really great way to do this. It shows that people have actually thought about how does this work rather than doing something that really is Yep. just very simply responsive so it's it's got adaptive elements as well as mm -hmm. the general responsive responsive nature oh, the that that's good um 
You know, that's probably the best explanation I've heard for why that's a better approach. So thank you. That's a good one. I will be stealing that. Oh, I'm glad. Um, <laughs> you know, because we're running into that a lot and we're still dealing with, like mm -hmm. you said, we have in a lot of corporate places, they work off of laptops or yes. tablets. And that's mm -hmm. very different from a 32 inch or 27, 28 inch monitor on their desktop. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. So we're still making courses at 955 by 650 because that fits on a laptop without mm -hmm. scrolling. Yeah. Yeah. So as a result, scroll, you've yeah. got a little, you got a little screen on your, mm -hmm. on your uh, desktop. And then you've got the big thing filling up your whole laptop and it just looks yeah. really weird. Um, and Absolutely. unfortunately, that's kind of the nature of where we are right now in a lot mm -hmm. of places. That's it's part of the tool issues, and and I've, mm -hmm. and I've been wondering about the scrolling. You know, what some of the benefits would be, but I hadn't really thought about the responsive part of it. That makes so yeah, much uh, sense. I, I I think that that's key to it, and I mean, scrolling is at the heart because a lot of it comes down to legacy technology and things that yes. we had in place a long time ago um, in the same way we often you know we talk about pages and you know click next to move to the next page yes. it's yeah. very much almost <laughs> as if it's like a textbook but online um, and so i think that by making things more like a website which for most people now that's what most of their what most of their online experience is. You know, I read all my news online. I don't get physical papers delivered anymore. Um, I read books on my Kindle. Um, exactly. I listen to a lot of audio yep. books. Um, but I'm I'm used to consuming things in mm -hmm. in a different way now. Um, and we're used to seeing things that are very graphically high quality and um, that are very slick. Um, that incorporate, you know, rich media, that incorporate video, uh, that incorporate animations and, and audio in a more sophisticated way rather than just the, I'm reading out all the text that's showing on screen for you, which and, is and, an absolute killer. And, and you said <laughs> so a, a key thing of it is more, you, you yeah, have device choices. And, and for example, we all like doing things like, for example, I have a Kindle. I like to read on my Kindle. I like to listen to Audible on my PC or phone. I like to watch certain things like YouTube on a TV. You know, it's funny. So we have all these choices that we can make of how we digest the food. I, 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 we have a joke that we were talking about yesterday. We, we were thinking of doing this as an absolute joke. So pardon my, it, it's not meant in bad taste, but we were going to come up with something called neurorectal learning. And uh, it's all about inputs and outputs. And, <laughs> and uh, so we were going to have some fun. It's kind of a joke, uh, probably blog or podcast that we do on that because there's so many theories there's so much this and that but it does come mm -hmm. down to common sense preferences and and you're mm -hmm. so right that we are not adapting to the new technologies as quickly yeah. as we should especially if we've been in it for a long time because we all get mm -hmm. used to doing Absolutely. it in a certain way and 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 it's just fascinating if we keep ourselves active and flexible on things. And yeah, you, like you said, you can read your Kindle. You can go on, on Kindles, on phones, on laptops, on tablets. You've got a lot of choices. And mm -hmm. as, long, as long as as long as the format is right. Yes. Because another yeah. problem, another problem, is that the number of P PDFs that people still mm -hmm. include in mm -hmm. learning, and you try and read a PDF on a phone. Good luck. You're not just scrolling up and down you're no. scrolling backwards and sideways uh, and up and down absolutely. it's yep. a complete and utter nightmare and some mm -hmm. of the ebooks that you get um if they're um some of the ebooks, particularly some of the academic ones are almost <laughs> written in that way as well so yeah. you're going you know you read along then you move down then you move up and you spend your whole time to, and then eventually you go i can't i just can't do this any longer Yep. Yeah, that's absolutely. a, that's a really I mean, good point. <laughs> that's a really good point because it is about the content, how the content looks, where it yes. looks, and how it looks best. Absolutely. And how we can make sense of that. Um, so, so again, moving, moving back to that and some of the things that I was saying earlier, you know, um, looking at how we learn um, and the, the real cognitive side of things, making sure that things are presented effectively so that people can actually receive the content um, that that's an absolute key you know making people making it difficult because you haven't really thought about it um or you're just doing it the same way that you've always done it mm -hmm. uh, I, I you know 
that's a big no-no, but it's something I think we're all somewhat guilty of because we're just so used to doing it in a certain way and we don't necessarily go back and think, oh, actually, this PDF, this was great on a desktop, right. but actually it isn't rendering properly on a mobile phone, so why haven't we tested it properly? Why, why aren't we doing that? <laughs> but, uh, I, I think that thinking about how we can do it to make it work really well, because, I mean, I know that's something that um, the guys at... Um, who've made Evolve have done that, uh, obviously, um, which we, we use as part of Learn Appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and making sure that actually you can incorporate things that will work across all devices and very much having a device agnostic approach um, to make sure that you get the best learning experience, no matter what you're using. Um, because, of course, we can't uh, guarantee the different types of technology that are available or not. Well, that music signifies we, we have gone 30 minutes, a little bit more. And uh, Lucy, will, will you come back on? I would be very, very happy. I've got a lot more to say. I'm I know, very sorry. we haven't gone through a lot. There's a lot more. and But we're chunking. We're chunking the shows right we're now. We're chunking it. Yes, we're, we're chunking it. Because <laughs> uh, I know all of us can go on for a long time. So uh, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a hard thing. You know, when we when we met at Learn Appeal, you and I in the uh, in the Learn Appeal stand booth for the people here. Um, stand, 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 stand. Um, we were talking quite a bit about the cognitive part. You know, we were talking about you know neuron receptors, and it's so you know it can get pretty interesting and pretty deep in it, and it's a yeah. lot of fun. It's, it is it's, amazingly good fun. So we appreciate you coming on big time. Good luck on the. Um, on the doctorate, I, I am sure you are going to take very good advantage of that. So uh, we wish you luck on that and success. And Leslie, till next week. Yeah, I'll see you then. Thank I'll you, everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. If you want Thank to get a hold of, okay. of Lucy, we'll put her information below, as well as Learn Appeal's link if you want to learn more about Learn Appeal. It's a great, a great charity and great project. And we will see you folks next week on eLearn Chat. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Hey, bye, everyone. Bye, bye everyone.